such a pleasure to be back in Warsaw, and I really regret that I wasn't here yesterday because I would have seen many, many more of these amazing women that we've just seen this morning. What I also regret is that those women weren't so abundant when I was younger, a little bit more than half my life ago when I was a postdoc at MIT or even earlier at university. We didn't have so much encouragement and role models back then. So um, I will talk about why we need more women in leading positions in science and what we can do about it. It will be an overview um, <clears throat> of the challenges of them. You probably heard many of them yesterday and why we still face these challenges, but why it is important to, to, come, to overcome them. And in the end, I will provide a few um, solutions. <clears throat> First, let me start with this picture. This is a picture of this year's members' assembly of the very distinguished German Academy of Science in Leopoldina. And why I show this, it's an image that we find still very normal in Germany. You see mostly men, mostly with white hair. I guess I can see two women in this, and one of them is a former high school teacher and now the science minister, so she also is not a man. And in order to underpin this image, I would like to give you a few numbers. That is the percentage of female members in national science academies. Let me pinpoint to the percentage in Poland, which is 4%. I must say that is pretty poor. But in Germany, with the 10%, we are not doing much better. Taken together of Leopoldina and Akatech, we only have 10% female membership in the most prestigious academies of science. Um, but the national academies, of course, are not an exception. Um, and this is why the United Nations have um, chosen gender equality as one of their sustainable development goals, which they issued in 2015. If you see in politics, there was a growth between 2000 and 2017 from 13.2% to 23.4%. That looks impressive at first sight. But if you calculate, it's only a growing of 0.6 um, points per year. And if we continue in that speed, it will take 44 years until we reach the 50%. Also, only one third are in middle and senior management positions still. So we know why this is one of the 17 sustainable development goals. Let's move back to science. In this graph, I show you, and I think it's an excerpt of the she figures that is published by the European Commission every other year. Um, this is the percentage of women in Europe. And I have put on this picture, I haven't taken all of them, the lowest number, which is in Belgium, Belgium with 15.6, the highest number in Romania, I'll come back to that in a moment, the average in the EU is 20.9, but Germany, and I'm very embarrassed about that, is the second but last, with only 70.3% women in top-level positions in science. That includes the professorships or a Max Planck professorship or something like that. Um, I think these numbers speak for themselves, and we should do something about it. I'm sure you have seen this picture many times yesterday. It is the famous picture about the leaky pipeline. And that leads to it that if younger women <clears throat> go to university or find themselves in any PhD programs, they think everything is fine because 40, 60 percent, that is a corridor that I find still reasonably acceptable. Um, until they reach PhD, if you take all disciplines, they move within this corridor of being between 40 and 60 percent. The real drop happens after the PhD when you get to the thing that we call Habilitation in Germany and later to the top level positions. The women drop down to 20% or 29, 20.9% 20 in Europe, as I said, on average, and the men move up to 80% to the top level positions. Um, let's have a look to the authorships, because they also tell you a lot if you look at them in more detail. Um, 
29.8 or roughly 30% of all authorships are women. It's not so bad, you may think, but only 18.1 can be found amongst those in the key author position, which is mostly the last one. And that happens specifically in the high impact medical research um, <clears throat> fields where really only 20% are group leaders or, or even department heads. That is definitely not enough. Another graph with numbers. This is the vast gender gap behind the Nobel Prizes. And here I show a picture of all Nobel Prizes that have been awarded since 1901 until very recently. That, that is um, a reflection of 8th of October of this year, um, only 5.5% 5 .5 of all Nobel Prizes are women, and 94.5% are men. The situation gets even worse if you take the Nobel laureates only in the STEM disciplines, such as um, physiology and medicine, chemistry or physics, and there it is out of 605 Nobel laureates, um, only 18 are women, that is less than 3%. Is it possible that only that few very, very outstanding women have been in this area? I don't think so. So why do we have so few women in leadership positions in science still? I'm sure the cultural forces continue to stand in the way ranging from, and we've heard that before, girls being steered toward other professions from very early age. Sexual harassment does play a role, and I don't know whether you've seen an interview with Frances Cordova, in the, of the head of the National Science Foundation, when she also joined the Me Too debate and also says that sexual harassment really drives women out of a scientific career. Um, of course, we uh, talk about the potentially career-stalling effects of having children, but that is so obvious, and even men, when you talk to them about the gender e equality, they immediately come up, oh, we should do something about um, kindergarten and things like that, so I won't even touch that. Um, what I think is the most important reason why we still have this gender inequality, and that is the gender bias. And when I talk about gender bias, I talk about three in four people, not men, people, including women, of course, believe um, are gender biased, even moderately. If you don't believe it, um, take that Harvard test. Um, you can find it on the website. It is an implicit test. Um, I did it myself. And guess what I was? Yes, I am moderately gender biased, if you're very honest with yourself. I will do it back in two or three years or four years. I'm 60 now and I still am gender biased. Or maybe it's because of that I'm gender biased. So you find that gender bias has a particularly strong effect on the academic disciplines emphasizing all the time the academic brilliance of their scholars, such as philosophy, physics, or mathematics. These subjects or disciplines are much more male-dominated than others. And this, that is despite the evidence that cognitive capacities do not depend on gender. Women are considered by less as intellectually brilliant than white males. And this, was, this is also in the, underpinned by a study that was done in the Princeton University. Of course, there are many other reasons, such as the lack of straightforward career paths. I myself was a victim out of that. When I came back from the United States, where I did a postdoc in the, uh, in, at MIT, I didn't really dare. Of course, I'm of a slightly different generation than the majority in this room to go for this unsecure um, path that was waiting ahead of me, because I also wanted to start a family. Um, so I applied for a job that was promising me a more um, permanent career. Um, I think the names of most STEM disciplines are also not appealing to women, and I give you one example. Um, women really prefer to go for fields 
which promise potential benefits to humans. One example is really being observed in the Technical University in Darmstadt, um, where they in, inserted or introduced the women of medical technology, which is really hardcore engineering what the women stu uh, study there, but immediately just labeling this specific field medical technology, they could recruit many more women into this, um, into this study. But not only the labels of disciplines matter, it's also the language that matters. And in many countries, gender bias is cemented in its language. I guess that's certainly true in Germany where we'll still have male and female. And when you, there is a call for applications, you usually call for only the male version. Also, it also appeals to female. Women tend to underestimate their talents. We have heard that quite a bit this morning. And I think, again, the gender bias is responsible for that, which is really deeply rooted in our culture. Um, women are less visible than men. We've heard that already. Um, <clears throat> and there is the glass ceiling. Perception matters. Women are considered aggressive, whereas the men with the same features are assertive. Women are considered difficulties, men behaving the same have character. And this is even more true, and let me tell you this from my perspective, when we approach the glass ceiling at around the age of 50 and plus. So why is it so important to have more women in STEM? And this is just a summary of what you already know, of course. We do not exploit the talent tool, uh, the, the, the pool of talents. And we all know that there are only a very small percentage in the population of the really highly, highly talented people amongst both men and women. But if you think that 80% of the top positions are occupied by men, you start wondering, are they maybe more mediocre and not the highest talent? And wouldn't it be better to have the highest talent of women also in this pool of the highest <coughs> top level positions? Women do ask different questions and solve other problems. What we think of science problems affect everyone, children, women, and men, and what science can solve, and for whom things are designed have a lot to do with who is doing the research. We have already also heard that mixed teams are more efficient and creative, <clears throat> and a McKinsey study has actually underpinned this that companies with a higher proportion of women in management positions are financially more successful. And after all, half the population is female, and publicly funded institutions that, that fund science, such as universities, should reflect the demographic composition of the population at all stages of their careers. So I do believe that gender equality is a value in itself. So I'll show you a list of possible solutions and have only time to go a slightly more into detail of a few of them. Quota, of course, then anti-bias training, starting at the top level of research institutions, change language and labels, encourage networking without a formal agenda, maybe the, um, the hidden agenda, introduce straightforward career paths, enhance transparency for recruiting criteria, enhance visibility of excellent women, and provide leadership training and other programs for women. So let's go to the quota. Here I show you two graphs. One is the women's representation in advisory boards in three countries without quota. <clears throat> that is Portugal, Germany, and Austria. You can see the numbers for yourself. That's not doing very well whereas Norway, who's had legislated quotas, already have 36% of women in their advisory boards, and the same is true in Iceland, even better, they have 46% of women in advisory boards. Now let's have a, um, a quick look at the representation in national parliaments, and I, I uh, pinpoint to Belgium. Belgium in 1994 did not have any quota, and there was only 12% in national par parliaments. Now, 20 years later, 
um, they have 39.0%. I think it's, it looks impressive, and it, it seems and proof that quota work, especially if you, specifically if you compare it to the other countries, but it's still going rather low, because after 20 years, they have not even reached the corridor that I personally find exec, um, acceptable, which is the corridor between 40 and 60% men or women either way. The most common argument against quota in research is, and I hear that very often still nowadays, from Max Planck directors, Max Planck presidents, but also from company heads, we select on the basis of scientific excellence. That is easy to agree, but it is wrong. So why is this wrong? There's only a small proportion of outstanding talents, as I said before, among men and women. And if men occupy 80% of top positions, then there must be many less talented in these positions, as I said before. So if we recruit on the basis of excellence, that must mean we have to look for the very best among men and women for our top positions. But of course, going for quota, you have to do it in a differentiated way. The low-hanging fruits are to, um, put, to fill the positions in committees, advisory boards, and so on, all the committees that are um, the positions where you really take decisions. Um, for the top positions in research, it might be easier for some areas, more difficult for other areas, um, but you really have to go out and actively um, seek for the women for the many reasons that I've said before. And also in the research funding, um, quota may work against um, your, actual, your actual goal. So I have to leave the quota even though I would love to continue talking about them because I used to not believe in quota when I was below 30 as a postdoc at MIT. Now I am a firm believer in the quota. Another very, important thing, another very important thing is the anti-bias training in the highest management level. I think only a firm conviction at the top management level that gender balance matters um, will actually lead to um, gender equality. And I was just asked to um, speed up a little bit, um, so I'll, I'll leave that point up to here. But I do think at the top management level, there needs to be conviction that um, I would just quickly go into enhancing visibility. Um, the Robert Bosch Foundation, I, we started eight years ago on a, a platform where if you, if you Google Academia Net, you will find the most, under, um, most outstanding um, female scientists in Europe. As of today, 2,791 profiles you will find there. Um, so if you have to occupy committees and so on and so on, just go there. They cannot self-nominate. They're nominated according to a set of criteria by the most prestigious member of the Academia Net, including the national academies and so on and so on. Um, so let me summarize. Um, inequality is persisting. Measurement should target the most agenda bias. Start at the top level management make recruitment criteria transparent, quota do work, we should enhance the visibility of women and encourage networking without formal agendas. I thank you very much for your attention.